I don't think you can achieve total balance, and I think it's rather a fatuous. I think it doesn't necessarily lead to a good building. I, it's, as I said, it's rather like asking a composer of a symphony to use every member of the orchestra because they're sitting there. And I think you, nuance is very important. I think there's some buildings that you make that are based upon organisation. And if the organisation, almost like a mathematical equation, if the organisation really works like a dream, it can force you to prioritise that over some particular aesthetic tricks that you might want to achieve. You have another building where the context and the materiality and the symbolism is so important that you say, look, we don't care about the purity of the structure. We'll use any damn thing that we can lay hands on. You know, fake bits of column, whatever the hell you want to do, because we want to have that thing. And you prioritize that. There are many pressures upon us. And in a certain way, in order to retain one's creative sanity, somehow, sometimes you have to deliberately ignore half of them. Otherwise, you become a sort of nitpicker, you know. You're so concerned with doing the right thing <coughs> here and doing the right thing there and doing the right thing there, correct, uh, don't let's try this. You lose it. You have to say, let's go for it. And then make sure it's not illegal afterwards. I think it, it is easy under the pressures of life that when you're in the middle of the construction of a complicated building, there are many pressures upon you often time pressure, finance pressure, pressure just to finding the right people to work on the project. And you don't have a lot of spare energy for the romantic creativity, but if you can have, the achievement of building gives you a certain intellectual freedom. I certainly found that after I did start building, and I haven't done that, I've done what, seven or eight buildings maximum, but I found after I'd done two or three buildings, that that curious sort of impediment was taken away. I remember people saying to me earlier times, you know, if you ever build, it will change your life. I think to be interested is important. I think uh, I think you have to know how to design the ordinary in order to design the interesting. I think you have to know, I think you have to be a reasonably adept, uh, straightforward organizer of space, understander of geometries, uh, understander of materials. I think you have to be a main, you have to have an element of the mainstream architect there. And I think that a lot of uh, kids sometimes want to go into the glamorous aspect of of experimental architecture without bothering with the the, the basics. I, um, you know, when I'm designing, even now in my early 80s, I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still really a functionalist. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's technology is so like saying statics is central to architecture. The ability to protect is essential to architecture. The ability to deal with natural circumstances, whether it's earthquakes or dampness, you know, in this country. Whatever you build is damp obsessed. Every building you do in Northern Europe, here particularly, you're obsessed by the damp because the damp gets in everywhere. If you're building in the Middle East, you know, there ain't no damp. You want damp, you're looking for water. You're obsessed by the, the sun. You know, if you're building in Japan, you're obsessed by the earthquake. Somewhere, else, you know, when they built the early houses in Australia, which I visited many times, they were obsessed by the animals creeping around them to keep away from these horrendous animals that they had there. There's other obsessions which have to be dealt with.
so technology is there. I think it's like saying, you know, we need we need water to live. Yes, it's there. Don't make. What, what else can we do with water? You can manipulate water into a gin and tonic, which is a very agreeable extension of water. <laughs> or you can make uh, water that you can drink upside down, or you can make water into uh, something that reminds you of South America, or you can make water into elegant sort of Chinese tea, which is associated in your mind with a ceremony or with a certain sort of person. It's still water, you just still need the water. And to pretend you don't is ridiculous. Just to pretend that we can do without technology, I think, is ridiculous. I think that we have uh, far too many boundaries. I think that architecture sometimes falls into the trap of making, it sound, making itself sound cleverer than it is. I think that there's a tremendous... Uh, I have a, a great uh, criticism of the last 30 or more years of architectural education, which has placed far too much emphasis on theory and not enough interest in actual building. And I think there's a whole generation of uh, architecture teachers who are basically theorists. They're interested in politics, gender, social patterns, da 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 da, and they wouldn't know a good building from a bad, you know. And they have too much influence in the schools, particularly the American schools. Uh, and the architects are treated, and the architect teachers are treated as a sort of, oh yes, you're a building guy, you know, you don't, you don't understand ideas, you don't understand theory. So I blame theory for getting in the way. Too much theory in architecture, most of it's total bullshit anyhow. Utopia is an excuse. excuse. I think utopia is used to say, well, all the usual rules don't apply, therefore, why not? What I'm saying is, the why not can come out of extending the rules. It's a different attitude. Uh, in particular, I object to work such as that by Archigram being referred to as uh, a utopian. I don't think any of the work I've done, or very little of it, is actually utopian. I regard it as being experimental or developmental or simply straightforwardly within the tradition of making buildings. Even anti-buildings are concerned with buildings. I think it was concerned with the forming of objects and the making of circumstances in which people can live and enjoy the fruits of living. And I think that Archigram was very concerned with invention. I don't think it was a deep philosophical position. I think it was very much a series of enthusiasts about technology and about the world that they found themselves in and the way in which you could develop it and, and invent things to add to the pre-existing language. The drive to be experimental at the moment has been misunderstood as to do with shape, not with experiment, not with atmosphere, not necessarily with organization, not necessarily to do with idea, but shape. And I think the danger is that if you have a whizzy shape, people say that's experimental. Whereas the thinking behind it might be really very ordinary. I'm very interested always in the extension of the architectural vocabulary. I think we work within an extremely narrow vocabulary. You know, we have all the wonderful things that have happened in the last 50 years or 100 years, whatever. But you know, still to put a irregular building on a site involves people putting windows in a wall and putting a door in a doorway. You know, surely there are other ways of looking from a sheltered condition out into the landscape. Surely there are different ways of entering a building. You know, that I often say that there is the tyranny of the window. But the most primitive people made a wall and put a hole in it. Surely we can do better than that. Isn't it?
you know, I think that in China, you see these giant cities and giant housing schemes. And for my psychology, I think, how do you escape? Where do you go? Where do you go if you have a girlfriend? Where do you go if you want to rest? Where do you go if you want to do sit fishing? Where do you go if you just want to sit under a tree? There ain't a tree. Or if there is, there's a sort of somebody watching you or whatever the hell. You know, it's, it's, to me it would be claustrophobic. I'd hate to live on the 25th floor in a thing that long and you have to go up and down an elevator. I can just walk out. I can walk out here, I can walk out and I can just go and sit under a tree if I wish to do. I can go and see people if I wish to do. It's great. Now, I know that there's a dem demographic issue, you know, how do you put all those millions of people if you lay them all flat in two-story buildings? You presumably cover the whole of China. But I'm not sure whether we... I don't know who's working on that in China. I have a horrible suspicion there aren't very many people. I might be quite wrong. But my sniff is that everybody's so busy and so pragmatic that everybody, the, the, the advanced architecture in China is thought of as <laughs> interesting looking. And not very many people thinking about what people actually do. No, is that being unfair? I think if you have a Biennale that does not allow architects to show off, you lose the plot because it's a show. It's like having a circus with no elephants, you know. It might be humane, but it's going to be a boring circus. I think you have to have, you have to take advantage of the ambition of, of individuals to show their stuff off. Uh, on the other hand, if you didn't have any intellectual basis at all, if you didn't have anybody prepared to discuss issues, uh, it, it, it would be just a sort of show-off show. I think you have to have a very skillful balance, and a lot depends upon the organiser. You need, the organisers need to have one foot in the real world of building and another foot in academe and to be able to mix it carefully. I think you need both. <laughs>